Hi, Jeff Spira here again. And today I'm going to talk about an interesting voyage. Uh, it's actually of a group of ships. It's called the, it's the Destroyer Squadron 11. And this happened in 1923. Um, these destroyers are the Clemson class. Um, there was a series of 156 destroyers. Uh, that served in the Navy from right after World War I all the way through World War II. And most of them, were, again, were used, um, particularly in the North Atlantic runs, um, protecting the convoys uh, in the early parts of World War II. They didn't use them as strict fighting ships like they did in the South Pacific against uh, the Japanese, but they were... Um, they were predominantly, um, you know, escort sort of uh, uh, destroyers against uh, submarines attacking the, the, the ships. But anyway, these um, these Clemson class ships were built from 1919 to 1922 in a number of places. So it was actually a redesign of the of the uh, World War One Wix class. Now the Navy named ships after the first ship, so. So they, 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 the first one they built was, was the Clemson, uh, and, uh, um, <clears throat> and the, it was named the Clemson, so they named the whole class of ships that way. And it was, there were 156 of them, and they, um, um, they, they had additional range over the uh, original World War I uh, destroyers and more power and uh, um, you know, it was a it was an upgrade from the from the basic World War One thing. The, the uh, Navy colloquially knew them as flush deckers because the decks were flush, or four stackers or four pipers, they called them as well. So, um, you, you, if you watch any of the old uh, war movies, you know you see, uh, well, it's see, there's on a four piper. You know that was uh, that was a common term that uh, that the Navy called these ships. So. Um, anyway, there was uh, there were um, fourteen of them uh, assigned to uh, um, the. Uh, Des it was called Desron Eleven. It was really um, uh, the Destroyer Squadron Eleven. So, and they were based uh, at the time out of um, out of Alameda in the San Francisco Bay area. So. Um, these, uh, these ships would, would run out and they would do wartime drills and that sort of thing. The person who they assigned to be the commander of this group was, was named was Captain Edward H, I'm sorry, Edward H. Watson. And he was a, a graduate of the Naval Academy in 1895. And he, he commanded the group. Um, he'd served in the Spanish-American War the Philippine insurrection in the, in the um, 1904-05, I think it was, and also World War I. So he was promoted to captain in 1917. So he actually fought in World War I uh, aboard a destroyer. So he, he was, uh, um, you know, captained a, a destroyer then. So, so he was assigned as the Commodore of Desron 11 in July 1922. So it was his first time as a unit commander. Okay. So, um, and the, the, um, uh, they began an a exercise, a run down the California coast, and they were going to take 14 destroyers to uh, San Diego. Um, and uh, uh, so that, that, and it was a, it was a simulation of, you know, wartime. So they were, they were going to be running at high speeds and doing wartime maneuvers and that sort of thing and a training uh, sort of thing. So, um, <clears throat> so that day, uh, September 1st, 1923, um, there was a, uh, well, that was actually before it. That was about a week before it. There was a, um, a big earthquake in Japan. It was called the Kanto earthquake, which is in southern Japan. And it had um, created, I, I, I don't know if you remember, but uh, uh, during the, uh, the big uh, earthquake uh, that, that uh, Fukushima was involved in, uh, the, w the waves uh, and the tsunamis actually came to the west coast of the U.S. So there were, um, there were effects that create all over the ocean uh, during that. So they had um, 
<clears throat> big swells and uh, large strong currents um, uh, along the coast of California during that, that time. So, um, so the the um, the actually the currents uh, normally run north to south, um, which it's it's the Kuroishi Current that runs uh, north from Japan, just like the Gulf Stream is runs north of. Uh, you know, north along the, the uh, east coast of the U.S., well, the Kuroishi Current runs north uh, from Japan, and it runs upward towards the, uh, Alaska and then turns around and runs south uh, down the coast of, uh, of, you know, British Columbia, Washington, Oregon, and California. And actually, um, it runs past uh, the... the Point Conception in, in Southern California and, and then hits the coast again in, in down in Mexico and then some of it curls around backwards. There's a there's kind of a corner there at Point Conception and then much of Southern California is insulated from from that current because of the offshore islands and, and uh, you know, the, just the shape of the coastline. Uh, so so it's actually warmer in Southern California. Water is warmer than it is uh, couple hundred miles down the coast of Mexico. Uh, so any, in any event, um, the, um, um, this, uh, event is, uh, this war game, let's say, uh, that, that was happening, uh, was in, um, mid September, I guess it was the 8th of September. So they left out of, um, out of, uh, uh San Francisco. Now, that day, earlier in that day, there was a there was a, a, a shipwreck at uh, Point Conception area, and it was called the Cuba. Uh, it was uh, they, had, they had mistaken some of the currents and that sort of thing, and it was uh, it was a mail ship that was running down the coast, and they uh, they had gotten into some trouble and they had run aground and uh, and crashed uh, in that sort of area. So. Um, Anyway, so they were probably there were pro probably uh, unusual currents at the time uh, when they left. So they began their uh, run down the coast, and they made through swells and currents. And uh, and and in, it happened to be a very foggy day then. And this was the days before uh, they had uh, radar. So um, they they ended up uh, following each other in line. It's pretty easy to see the, the wake of a, of a ship in front of you. Um, even if it's foggy, you, you can see it, the water changes. So they end up lining up and they all, they all, only the lead ship needed to, um, needed to navigate and everybody else just followed the lead ship. So, uh, the lead ship at this time was the USS Delphi. Uh, and it was the one that had, uh, Captain Watson on it, who was commanding the whole group of 14 destroyers. So, um, anyway, they, um, they, uh, at the time, the, um, they had just put in radio direction finding, um, and, uh, radio direction finding was a, was a way to manually determine, uh, the direction, uh, now, I used this a lot in uh, in uh, back in my commercial fishing days. I'd go offshore, and if it was, I had no Loran and I had no radar, and uh, uh, to find my way back to Morro Bay when I was uh, out albacore fishing, for instance, you know, 100 miles offshore, you would I would draw a bead on on several uh, radio direction finding uh, um, stations, and uh, and. Uh, well, let me show you. I still have my radio direction finder. One second here. Okay, here we go. This is my uh, radio direction finder. Um, and it, you can see it's got this uh, loop antenna on top that rotates. And uh, with it, you can locate the direction to, um, to one of these uh, radio direction finder uh, transmission stations. And they were they were big and powerful, and they were... You know, every I don't know 50 miles along the coast, so uh, it, it was pretty easy to determine. There's one at Point Arguello, um, and uh, uh, well, <clears throat> I used to find the direction home in the fog, and then I would uh, at the end of Morro Bay, there at the end of the of the uh, uh, breakwater, there was a uh, 
It was what was called a beeper, which was a low power radio direction finding thing. And it only worked about five miles or something. But I could use this device as a uh, as to know the direction to the end of the pier. So, you know, you just drive right towards it and then eventually you run into a buoy. So uh, a lot of times you couldn't see very far, you know, maybe uh, less than 50 yards. And uh, so I'd have put my crewman up on the bow and he'd look for the buoy. Once we spotted it, then it was pretty, pretty uh, straightly determined which direction to go because you could see the, the, the buoys in the channel entrance and that sort of thing. So, so it, <clears throat> it was a good way to um, find your way back <clears throat> in the fog. So, um, in any event, they had just started using radio direction finding in the Navy, and they had one at Point Arguello, which is which is right there at the, the corner. You know, Point Conception and Arguello are just maybe five miles apart, and they're um, at the turn between the uh, the the north south running coast uh, between San Francisco and and there and. Uh, and the east-west running coast between Point Conception and Santa Barbara and then inwards towards LA and that sort of thing. So um, anyway, they, the uh, Delphi was, uh, had gotten a measurement of the location of the uh, uh, Point Arguello and, and they d dismissed it. This was all new technology to them, so they didn't trust it. Now, what the, the method they were using was called dead reckoning, and they, and they used the speed of the boat and the direction and to determine the location. Well, if you know the boat's going 20 knots based on how many RPM your shafts are turning, um, and you're going over waves, over swells, um, you're actually, you're, you're going 20 knots over the surface and the surface is curved, <laughs> you know, so, so you're actually going up and down and, and uh, you're covering, you know, only 18 longitudinal miles uh, compared to 20, you know, miles over the surface. So it, it tends to, it tends to uh, uh, shorten that information. So when they determined that they were, uh, um, at the at the turning point, which would send them down the Santa Barbara Channel, they um, they turned, uh, you know, to uh, to starboard or to port. Sorry, <laughs> sort of turned to port to go uh, into the into the channel, and uh, and the Delphi was um, was about five miles short, and uh, and it ran into the rocks at uh, at. Uh, Point Arguello. It's it was it's called Devil's Jaw there for a reason. It's a it's a very rocky outcropping and um, so the the uh, the the Delphi with the captain aboard ran into the rocks and uh, and they were going a full tilt. They were going twenty knots. So um, he started uh, blowing the uh, a siren and uh, the the ship started breaking up and it. Uh, it was pretty fast, so um, the um, it uh, so he kind of, they kind of alerted. He was trying to alert the ships that were following him because the, the order was follow the wake of the ship in front of you. So um, and uh, three men died in the in the collision with the shore. So. Um, uh, anyway, the, the second ship was called the USS SP Lee, and it was following about a, a couple hundred yards behind. And uh, they saw the Delphi suddenly stop, and he turned to, to port to the left uh, in response, and that brought him into more rocks. So um, they, uh, they they got they got out of the way of the of the Delphi, but uh, not not uh, from running themselves aground as well. Uh, the USS Young was next and, um, and it had, uh, didn't try to turn. It was trying to, uh, apparently trying to reverse. Um, and it, it ran into the still revolving propellers of the De Delphi. So, and so the, the Young was, uh, was damaged a lot and, and actually sunk uh, in Russia water, uh, uh, 
collapse the ship onto its starboard side and within a minute and a half and trapped uh, a lot of people down in the engine and fire room down below. Uh, 20 men died in the first two minutes there, so a minute and a half, something like that. The next ship was the USS Woodbury, and they turned to starboard, but uh, they struck an offshore rock. There was a, there's a, a series of rocks uh, sticking out into the ocean just uh, just south of where the Delphi uh, ran into the sol you know they ran into the beach part of rocks. The Nicholas turned to port and also hit a rock. So, um, and then the Fuller uh, crashed next to the Woodbury. So. Um, the next ship was the Chauncey, and they, they could see what was going on by the time they got close, and they tried to uh, uh, rescue sailors that were in the water, and, uh, um, and they, they ended up running aground as well. Um, the next ship was the uh, uh, Farragut, um, and um, it uh, was able to, uh, it, it, it did run aground, but then it was able to back up. And, um, you know, apparently the ships were, were slowing down something somewhat after that. There was another ship that, uh, that got involved, and it was the USS Summers, and it was lightly damaged, uh, and it bumped into a rock. So um, the captain of the ships behind them uh, was the Percival Kennedy, the Paul Hilt Hamilton, the USS Stoddart and the USS Thompson. Um, the commander had had detected what was going on and figured out that there was a big issue going on, and so he had he had uh, he was commanding those five ships, and he told them to stop, to slow, and then stop. Uh, so so they didn't weren't involved in this big uh, this big crash. So um, anyway. Um, I had uh, I have actually uh, dove on s two of these ships uh, in back in the 1970s. Uh, I had a chance to go down and, and take a look at them in the water. They don't look like this anymore. They're they're of course all broken up and and in bits and pieces and and you know it's the sea takes its toll on ships that have been around for a long time. And got to remember this is almost 100 years ago. So uh, when I was there, it was they were. Well, that was would have been 40, 40, 45 years uh, ago. I mean, forty-five years after the event, and they were uh, they were in in fairly rough shape then. Uh, in a lot of them were in pieces and and uh, you know strewn junk. But uh, I, I I actually had uh, dove on it in a uh, using a, a hookah kind of system because that's what the ab divers used in, in back in Morro Bay. So. I went down with one of the one of the ab divers and uh, um, and and got a chance to look around these ships at the time. So, in any in any event, uh, this was a big. Uh, it turned into a huge event. It's still uh, publicized well today. Um, and anybody that uh, um, you know trains on uh, running ships, particularly small ships, uh, they they study this incident in great detail. It was a it was a huge tragedy, and uh, seven destroyers uh, were completely destroyed. So, um, in any event, that's the story of uh, Desron Eleven, uh, the destroyer uh, group, and uh, hope you find this of interest. And uh, and um, you know, I'm going to make more of these of of different uh, voyages. Some of them, uh, some of them real real events that that are well known and well publicized and some of them um you know ancient events that uh, may or may not have occurred uh and i'm just going to um, be presenting the information i know about them so that you can learn more about these uh these interesting voyages thank you for watching